Hey, peace and blessings. Y'all, how y'all doing? Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. It's 2021. And this is the first uh, segment of Real Talk with ZSJ in this new year, January 3rd, 2021. I hope your year has started off um, to be prosperous, to be healthy, um, all of the good things I hope is coming your way in the first three days of this new year. And today is um, kind of an impromptu. Um, I actually was inspired again yesterday um, to revisit the work of Samuel Yet. Um, he unfortunately uh, has been buried, uh, if you will. His work um, has been buried for a very long time. He uh, was the first African-American Washington, D.C. bureau chief for Newsweek magazine. So uh, Newsweek magazine uh, eventually fired him at with the pressure of the White House at the time, uh, Richard Nixon's administration. So um, anyway, without further ado, I'm going to do a little bit of a reading today of this book, The Choice right? The issue of Black survival in America. And I actually came to know of um, Samuel Yet several years ago through my own independent studies, um, reading folks like Marimba Ani, reading folks like Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Ben, um, all of the African um, epistemology that I could get my hands on. And I came across this book and uh, unfortunately, it is, um, I believe, out of print. Our, our, our ancestor, he is an ancestor now, I believe, died in 2011. He's actually from the D.C. area, actually lived here in Silver Spring. And I believe his two sons or one of his sons actually still lives in the area. I was able to cop this book earlier because I had it before years ago. And uh, when we moved from Ohio to here, I don't know what happened. So anyway, I don't know what happened to the book. So I had to pay a pretty penny for this book today. Uh, so if people um, still want this book, it, it is pretty expensive, but you can get it uh, from a black bookstore. It's on Amazon for $700. I would not advise you to pay $700 for this book, which is why I kind of want to do a reading of it today, because I think um, it's certainly still very relevant. The book, uh, the first edition came out in 1971, y'all, 1971. 50 years ago, it's 2021, uh, and it was a warning to Black people about what, you know, he had been seeing as a uh, journalist. I mean, you know, he's, this was when journalism was real, when journalists actually did their jobs and in, in, in dug a, underneath, uh, you know, the, the, the muck to find out what was really happening with the government and all of those kind of things. Certainly here in 2021, many journalists are paid off and um, certainly are not doing investigative journalist work anymore. So without further ado, uh, let me, I want to read the back of the book. But again, the author uh, is uh, Samuel Yet. The choice, uh, the foreword is by Barbara Reynolds, who at the time was a columnist for USA Today. Uh, and here are a couple of the things I'll read on the back. So about the author, Samuel Yet, uh, he was born in Harriman, Tennessee in 1929. He attended Morrison, Tennessee College, earned his bachelor's degree at Tennessee State University and his master's at Indiana University. He has worked as a reporter for the Afro-American and the Dayton Journal Herald in Dayton, Ohio. I was actually a little bit surprised to find that out. He was the associate editor of Ebony Magazine and a Washington correspondent for Newsweek. He was the first Black Washington correspondent for Newsweek. He currently writes, uh, this was when, you know, the book was published. He currently writes a column for the Miami Times and the Philadelphia Tribune, the Richmond Free Press, and the Tennessee Tribune. He has also served as information director at Tuskegee Institute, executive secretary of Peace Corps and the professor of journalism at Howard University. He's a photojournalist with one of two sons, Frederick uh, Walton Yet. He is the author of Washington and Two Marches, 1963 and 1983, a pictorial history uh, published in 1984. In 1972, the choice was selected 
as the nonfiction work of distinction, the highest nonfiction award of the Black Academy of Arts and Letters. It also won a special book award from the Capitol Press Club in Washington, D.C. So I'll go ahead and read the foreword because I thought the foreword was actually very good. Again, the foreword is by Barbara Reynolds, who was a columnist at um, USA Today. So this is from Barbara Reynolds. It says, my phone rang at the Chicago Tribune and my friend social activist Dick Gregory advised me to run out to a bookstore and pick up a copy of The Choice a tome written by a respected Black journalist, Samuel F. Yett. The book was so relevant to the Black condition, Gregory warned that both the writer and the book would soon be in trouble, which he mused, would it be? Would the system destroy the messenger or the message? It was 1971 when the choice roared off the press. At that time, I only half believed Gregory's warning. The USA is not in the book burning or censorship business, I thought. But later, after watching the mysterious disappearances of the choice from local bookstores and in 1975, the refusal of some Chicago bookstores to sell my book, Jesse Jackson, The Man, The Myth, and The Movement, I became a true believer. Yes, wheels do turn to stamp out life-saving information. But if yet has ushered in, had ushered in, gangster rap singing about the macho it is and to kill other blacks by now he would be a millionaire but instead yet cried genocide he set off the alarm documented his suspicions and for a time became an unhero at that time yet was the first and only black washington correspondent at newsweek his book landed in that newsroom like a sonic boom as yet tells it my bureau chief had a near stroke upon learning of the book's contents. He told me that the choice had so embarrassed high level policymakers that he had to get rid of me or shunned at the White House or he would be shunned at the White House. It wasn't long yet said until he was fired after refusing to accept his punishment of a transfer out of Washington. What Yet had sought was to exercise his First Amendment right to publish without being subjected to repression. But Yet's story of unfairness is almost standard for Black writers even today. While white journalists are often given time off plus research assistant to write books, Yet's research was a pink slip. He sued and the case stayed in court for six years. With the help of his attorney, uh, Clifford Alexander Jr. yet won the first round with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. But on appeal, the win was reversed. While yet battled in court, the Richard Nixon White House attempted to persuade newspapers not to review the book and major chains not to even sell it. The plan didn't work to the max only because distribution of the choice was off and running before the Nixon men could prevent it. They could only slow it down. Yet's book, Short on Emotion, told, told of a story, shocking, bitter truths. He showed how the United States during the 1960s was engaged in two simultaneous wars against people of color in Vietnam and here at home. The war against blacks was evolving because of technology. 1971, y'all evolving because of technology. Here we are in 2021, can you imagine? Was rendering this largely unskilled population useless, obsolete. Here you have a people who were brought to these shores because of their economic value. And now after they were no longer needed to dig the ditches and pick the cotton, there were no plans. To, there were plans to toss them on a human scrap heap. If that required creating a police state, huh? or fashioning a plan of legal genocide with concentration camps and forced sterilizations, then so be it. In essence, yet sounded the alarm of genocide and to sustain it, his cry reached into the liberness of federal government itself. Soon after the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., congressional members of the House 
Un-American Activities Committee mapped out a strategy to isolate and destroy the black guerrilla fighters and black nationalists. I think about that today because anybody who has black nationalist politics is shunned by both liberals and conservatives. It still happens today. Anybody who identifies as a black nationalist. The H, the House Un-American Activities Committee plan would seal off the ghetto. Listen to this. Seal off the ghetto. No one will be allowed in or out after sundown and basic constitutional rights would be suspended. President Johnson chose not to take that action. However, liquidation of some of the so-called radical elements, such as the Black Panther Party, did begin in the 1970s yet also pulled the cover off of the Great Society programs. The masquerade was over, yet dug underneath the glowing accounts of rhetorical flourishes about war on poverty and found a Trojan horse. <laughs> a Trojan horse. Yes, there were good intentions and I believe good programs, but yet also saw a pacification program. Not unlike that was being played out in Southeast Asia. Programs such as Job Corps still exist today. Community Action and VISTA aided in recruiting a network of community spies. These organizations still exist today. Job Corps and VISTA, I know for a fact, I don't know about Community Action, but I know Job Corps and VISTA still exist today. They also swelled corporate offices and fattened political bureaucracies while making hardly a dent in reducing poverty against whom or what then was the war being fought, right? Genocide can take many forms. It is enough drastic change in the status of Black Americans or in the character of political leadership to suggest that the choice of legal extinction does not exist today. The hard question now is, given today's reality, why would a government need any additional plan of genocide on one hand, black fratricide, or otherwise known as so-called black on black crime, is at such a record pitch, no outside force could pile up more bodies in a morgue or splash more blood on the street of African Americans than other African Americans themselves. And on the other hand, the armed militias, skinheads, Klansmen, and other white supremacists are on a rampage, murdering, burning black churches, and recruiting followers. The choice forces us to wonder whether there is not an invisible hand at work. <laughs> Does the USA need concentration camps when prisons work just as well? And if that is true, is there no other choice than for the black poor and other much maligned groups to go sheep-like into concentration camps, which today are prisons and jails? Despite the explosive anger of white men as evidenced in the Oklahoma City bombing of federal building, which killed 19, which killed 168 innocent um, people, including 19 children. Let me pause. The original um, book was published in 1971, and then this book has been updated. I meant to read that. This book has been updated several times since then. This is the 1996 version uh, that I'm reading. So this for this. Um, this in the beginning here, this foreword is taking into account what happened in the 90s. So I just wanted to make sure I gave you that. The original book was written in 1971. And then, of course, as people do, they, they do updates. Anyway, let's keep reading. In the 1970s, Yet could only hint at the devastation that could come from drugs, but he wisely foresaw its deadly potential, comparing it to the opium wars in China. Just as the supposed war against poverty began, became a war against blacks in some areas. The war against drugs in the 1980s became an assault on blacks. That resonates with me, y'all, because I was born in 1981 and I was impacted by this war on drugs in the 1980s. For people who know me, you know, I tell my personal story all the time. So this particular thing really uh, resonates with me. This sentence that says the war against drugs in the 1980s was basically a war and an assault on Blacks. It was. It is highly suspected that the lines in a 1995 movie about the Black Panthers where Black areas were flooded with drugs to desensitize 
revolutionary action. Okay, that's what the drugs were for to revel to de legitimize, right? And to be counter revolutionary, it's terrible to desensitize are not fiction. After the drug flow swept the communities, black violence became epidemic. The disintegration of families continued. Crack babies were abandoned in hospitals and black men were carted off to jail for long prison sentences, right? Mandatory minimums push out more hardened criminals to make room for nonviolent drug users. Who needs drug treatment more than jail cells but are denied it? And sentences for crack, the drug of choice in black communities, carry penalties 100 times heavier than for powder cocaine, the drug of choice for whites. A study by the National Center on Institutions and Alternatives in Washington, D.C. shows by the year 2010, with current laws in place, the majority of all Black and Hispanic males between the ages of 18 and 40 will be behind bars. Thus, the human scrap heap, which yet projected, is now in full force. This scenario is tragic, not only because there are now more Black men in prison than in college, that's actually um, inaccurate, but, but also because no one knows how many prisons are innocent, how many prisoners are innocent jailed because of selective harassment, planting of evidence, or inept defense. Yet when you see the invisible hand in motion shaping predictable sociological outcomes, yet is correct in continuing to sound the alarm, yet also tempted to wake up the nation in the, to the critical issue of health brutality. It is probably one of the most important issues affecting Blacks. Although it was not understood when Yet wrote his book, and is not sufficiently understood now. Ironically, the lack of health, the lack of access to health care was a gap the Black Panthers were trying to fill, but many were murdered by the police in cold blood. Black infant mortality is the highest in the industrialized world. TB is raging and HIV is escalating among the poor. Yet physicians, pharmacists, and dentists are being jailed harassed and run out of black areas at record rates. This sadly underreported phenomenon is what I call doctor demolition, yet pointed to this trend in the 1970s. It is spreading out of control in the 1990s and will explode in the year 2000. The demolition is taking place under the auspices of Medicox, Medicaid and the Drug Enforcement Administration. From Dayton, Ohio to Detroit, to Jacksonville, selective enforcement and misuse of federal laws are destroying innocent black physicians. Yet has done his job well. He has sounded the alarm. Thus the cry of genocide today is just as real as when Yet documented it in the 1970s. But now there are more accomplices. Those who spend their time merely planning banquets, selling dinner tickets, dressing for success, watching football games, taking drugs that were dumped into black communities for their destruction must know that when history is recorded, the silent will have played a role. Yet, even now, there is still time for revolutionary change, discipline over drugs, action over avoidance, faith in God over hopelessness can still save us. But right now, too many of us are sleeping through the counter revolution, okay? Now, that's her foreword. Here is the preface. This is really interesting and this is really important, you guys. And I'm reading this because the book is out of print and there are several people in my network who have been trying to get a copy of the book. So let me just go ahead and go through this because the original contents from 1971 are still here. This is just part one. We'll do you know part two and however many parts I need to break it up in. So a quarter century has passed since the choice was first published in 1971. Much has happened in the interim, but nothing has happened to reverse or substantially mitigate the book's original message. It is that African-Americans are in a survival crisis in America, that racism, poverty, greed, war, technology, and the erosion of constitutional rights have conspired to endanger a people to whom the society has never granted human and social value 
commiserate with scrutiny or security. Indeed, developments of the last quarter century have increasingly made the book original report and concerns undeniable realities in the lives of many millions of individuals and groups. Published by the Cottage Books since 1982, this is the 14th printing of softcover and 11th printing in cloth. Every word that appeared in the original text has remained in place in each subsequent edition, including this one. For good reason, I hope, I understood in 1971, as I do now, that decent minds tend to resist such indecencies as this book uncovers, however compelling the evidence. The original publisher, G.P. Putnam Sons, required thorough documentation. Of course, otherwise, it would have never agreed to publish the choice. My editor at Putnam's was overwhelmed by the documented threats to constitutional government and proof that the unconstitutional war in Vietnam and the profiteers from that war cared little about the well-being of the nation itself. But again, that documentation, he suggested that my title and subtitle focus too narrowly on the issue of race and granting my editor his due, the choice is still alone in documenting how extreme racists in the US and greedy profiteers who demanded the killing of millions of human beings in Southeast Asia are indeed one of this one and the same. For many readers, chapter four provides the best paradigm for their comprehending subsequent US invasions of say, Grenada, Panama, Somalia, and Iraq. Intense and deeply rooted racism, poverty, and economic dislocation, a sophisticated police state, a sophisticated police state in the 90s is really sophisticated now, and a federally sponsored drug culture and abortion with the with its inevitable dehumanization were all arrows pointed to genocide at home as well as abroad. My ultimate focus and title, therefore, became the issue of Black survival in America. Nonetheless, many students find the choice helpful in the study of law, economics, public health, psychology, and even education. Racism, of course, has been constant in American history. It was there at the founding of the United States of America. The war between the states did not end it, nor did the reconstruction, the legal segregation, or the civil rights struggle. The recent and current angry white male backlash, armed militia uprisings, paramilitary seizures, and the proliferation of racist propaganda, as discussed in chapter three, signal dangerous and race-based divisions. Scapegoats continue in season. The new Republican majorities in both houses of Congress seek to undo civil rights gains with a new deconstruction spearheaded by Republican House Speaker Newt Gingrich in the so-called contract with America. In human terms, any one-sided contract is bogus on its face. Additionally, the unilateral Republican contract is a new version of Richard Nixon's trickle down, Ronald Reagan's alleged voodoo, George Bush's adopted voodoo, and supply-side economic con games. All are these contributed to the so-called war on poverty actually being a war on the poor as detailed in chapter two. Depletion of the nation's middle class has resulted in more people in poverty now than when Lyndon Johnson began the Office of Economic Opportunity in 1964. A greedy technocracy propelled by the cybernetics, right? He's talking about the cybernetics back in the 1990s and the information highway increases the obsolescence of millions of ordinary citizens, disproportionately African-American. Meanwhile, as discussed in chapter five, black men and increasingly black women are disproportionately incarcerated, largely on drug convictions, while gang warfare is devastating generations of African-Americans. The current term contract on America implies that number one, Previous attempts of the greedy and powerful to take full control have now, in fact, been accomplished. And two, that in the usual mob terminology, somebody has taken out a contract for the disposal of some others who remain. The use of language characteristic of criminal underworld is instructive 
and must be accepted as a genuine statement of intent. It is an open notice to ordinary Americans, regardless of color, but specific warning to Black America. On October 16, 1995, Black men responded to the contract, warning its climate by answering to the call um, to the Washington Mall by Muslim minister Louis Farrakhan. Thus, counterposed are the contract on Black America versus the Black man's massive response as symbolized by the enormous and spiritually moving Million Man March. The call for the Million Man March came in search of atonement, whose validity lay in the extent to which the House of Black America is in disarray and in crying need of reconstruction. A federal report in 1995 confirmed my concern in chapter five that the plague of drugs and addiction is a basic source of destructive crime, lowered life expectancy, and the erosion of constitutional rights. Therefore, aside from the pledges taken by the entire multitude, perhaps nothing, perhaps nothing at the Million Man March was more significant than the presence of California gang leaders who joined hands who announced their truce and to renounce gang violence. The most recent previous printing of the choice featured three photographs on the cover, the Ku Klux Klan and impoverished neighborhood and the Vietnam Memorial. The symbolized racism, poverty, and war respectively, but as Barbara Reynolds insightfully notes in her foreword to this edition, black survival is also threatened by infracticide, black men against their black brothers instead of black men for black people. The response of a million or more black men to the evident cries becomes, if not a sure sign of hope, at least the presence of a critical mass Still at issue, however, is whether there are, is, there are sufficient self-love, alertness, unity, organization, and resources to counter the contract long ago issued and regularly renewed against Black America. Thus, as this book concludes, the final choice in African-American survival and the survival of America herself belongs to Black people in America. The final test of whether survival is, is deserved and likely is whether Black people and the totality of Americans love and care enough for each other to save ourselves. Samuel F. Yet, May 1st, 1996. So this is the introduction. It says a question of survival. So question of survival, right? I forgot to say to like this video and share it. Make sure if you're listening like the video, share it on your social media, share it with other people. I'm reading this book because it is out of print and it's instructive for what's happening uh, today here now in 2021 as we have more technological advances and we are becoming more and more irrelevant in the sense of the economy since technology uh, will be taking over a lot of jobs, right? So let's keep going. An introduction. I will likely, so make sure y'all like and share the video. Invite other people in. Let them know what it's about. This is really crucial. I'm reading this book right now. And this is just part one. I will not be obviously reading the whole book. Y'all see how thick it is. I can't read the whole book tonight. But anyway, the introduction. A question of survival. When the decade of the 1970s began, the United States government was officially was officially but unconstitutionally in the midst of two colored, I'm sorry, in the midst of two wars, a war of attrition, genocide against the colonized colored people of Indochina, and two, an expendiary law and order campaign repression and selective genocide against colonized colored people here in the United States. Although non-aligned, both colonized groups had made had made had much in common as discussed in part two, they were in fact victims of the same war, though in different theaters. In the United States, as in Indochina, victims of these undeclared wars painfully achieved high visibility during the 1960s. The colonized blacks inside of the United States were the subject of numerous and extensive studies and special programs, White House conferences, and plain gawking curiosity Occasionally, a collection of American society regarded as social antiques would present themselves for inspection in the nation's capital. Such a group arrived in the spring of 1966. A motley collection of Black poor, 
They were a spectacle even for Lafayette Park where they spent the night. Rest broken, poorly clothed and shivering, the two dozen Mississippi outcasts could not have been less in tune with the op opulence around them. Some still crowded inside and others huddled outside the several the several tents they had pitched in the park across Pennsylvania Avenue, squarely in front of the White House. These uninvited campers had braved a bone chilling mist that shrouded the park. Two years earlier, some of them had dared vote in the presidential election for the first time in their many adult years. Others were accused of participating in the Meredith March against fear, a walk quickly interrupted by the blast of a white man's shotgun that nearly took the life of James Meredith. Some of them might even have joined in that chorus along with Meredith March and that gave the first audience shouts of black power. Now they were homeless. They kept explaining that they were not the Negroes who had lived in at the deactivated Greenville, Mississippi Air Force Base were finally dragged out by the military. Instead, they insisted they had relied on the people in Washington to help them work out their needs in an orderly way. All of them had outlived their rights as tenants in the Mississippi federal system, but they had not outlived their faith in the government. They had been evicted from the land they had worked as sharecroppers, but they still allowed that failing might be theirs, that, that it must have been they who had not made clear that their need was great and their costs just. They hoped that federal anti-poverty funds could be rearranged for them to build houses and stay in the Delta. For that was home. Paper, appear, paper appeals failing, they brought their bodies to Washington to support their cause and demonstrate their need. The bureaucratic charades had reduced them to this tenant setting spectacle, a desperate effort to get the attention of President Lyndon B. Johnson and possibly embarrass him into action on their behalf. The Washington Post that morning carried a story on the telegram they sent to the president. It was signed, your neighbors. Their humor was lost on the president. There was no neighborly response. There was no response at all. In time, they were driven by harsh weather and dysentery back, hungry and homeless, to the rigors of survival in the Mississippi Delta. The spectacle of Lafayette Park kept alive the symbolic depravity of an inhumane history. Those and anguished inhabitants of the park were truly a dying people. So, there, so, so with their legions of millions left in the valleys of the Black Belt and in the teeming ghettos of Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Cleveland, and all the other welfare swell urban centers of the East, North, and West, they were obsolete people, described by then Labor Secretary W. Willard Wirtz as a human scrap heap. The, secretary, the Labor Secretary of the United States described Black people, his name was W. Willard Wirtz, W-I-R-T-Z, as human scrap heap. That's what he described Black folks as, a Labor Secretary in the United States, okay? We are piling up human scrap heap between 250,000 and 500,000 people a year, many of whom never appear in the unemployment statistics. They are often, and that still happens today, y'all, just so you know, they are often not counted among the unemployed because they have given up looking for work and thus count themselves out of the labor market. The rate of non-participation in the labor force by men in their prime years increased from 4.7% in 1953 to 5.2% in 1962. The increase has been the sharpest among non-whites increasing from 5.3% to 8.2% in that same period. The human scrap heap is composed of persons who, as consequence of technological development, okay, of their own educational uh, of, of educational failures and of environments of poverty and other causes that disqualify them for employment in a skilled economy, cannot and will not find work without special help, right? The 115,000 boys who failed the selective service educational test in 1963 are candidates 
for the human scrap heap. If we are to turn the human scrap heap into materials for richer progress and more rewarding lives, then private industry and our private institutions must help us to do the job that the government actions have only suggested needed doing. This is heavy, y'all. A people whom the society had always denied social value personality had also lost economic value. Theirs was the problem of all Black America, survival, survival. Examination of the problem must begin with a single overpowering socioeconomic condition in the society. Black Americans are obsolete people. <laughs> 1971, we this is 50 years ago, okay? It's, this should explain a lot to y'all, you listening. While this certainly is not accurate in a moral sense, nor at the moment biologically, it is true where in the 1970s, it becomes the issue. It is true in the minds and, and schemes of those who with inordinate power and authority control the nation. Hmm. While it may not be true among the general population, mass sentiments against oppression and possible genocide are not sufficiently strong to cause these schemes to fail. Black Americans have outlived their usefulness. Their racism, their raison d'etat to this society has ceased to be a compelling issue. Once an economic asset, they are now considered an economic drag. The wood is all hewn the water all drawn, the cotton all picked, and the rails reached from coast to coast. The ditches are all dug, the dishes are put away, and only a few shoes remain to be shined. Thanks to old blacks, backs, and newfangled machines, the sweat chores of the nation are done. Now, the sun, now the some 25 million black faces a society that is brutally pragmatic, technologically surly, technologically accomplished, I'm sorry, deeply racist, increasingly overcrowded and surly. In such a society, the absence of social and economic value is a crucial factor in anyone's fight for a future. Blacks in America have had 250 years of nationally sanctioned slavery and another 100 years of deceitful enslavement outside the national law. Now they are irreconcilably committed to personal dignity and justice as a people. Their patience, like the ox cart, is gone. But the hope remains that unlike the oxen, can cease to be driven and can be permitted to stay on human and civil terms. They want to survive, but only as men and women, no longer as pawns or chattel. Can they? This is most frightful and pressing question facing America in the 1970s. Those who say that the most urgent question is the environment should recognize that it is blackness that is unsightly in America. Ooh, come on, Sam. Those who say that it is war should face the fact that racism and arrogance of superiority that seeks economic and military exploitation is as much the nation's role in Birmingham as it is in Vietnam. And those who say that the most pressing issue is law and order should recognize the term for what it is. It's a euphemism for total repression and possible extermination of those in society who cry for justice where little justice can be found. This is 1971, y'all. We're in 2021 and we're still talking about the same stuff. Whether Blacks have a place in U.S. society is a choice that belongs to the nation. That choice was audaciously called to the attention of white America early in 1960 when four black college students sat down at a North Carolina lunch counter reserved for whites. For the 10 raw years of the 1960s, the nation noisily grappled with this choice, freedom or death for African Americans. By the end of the decade, blacks were forced to face evidence heaped painfully upon them the evidence showed that a choice had been made and freedom was denied. True, the decade of the 1960s provided some contrary indications. There were, for example, outpourings of new laws and pronouncements that ostensibly guaranteed not only freedom and security, but also socioeconomic progress. 
Blacks were visibly appointed to a handful of high federal positions. This was a kind of progress, but was also confusing. It helped obscure from many blacks and whites alike the true danger of being designed by repressive elements, okay? In significant instances, what appeared to be progress was in fact the vehicle of the danger itself. Ooh, I gotta read that again. Come on, I gotta read that again for y'all. It says, excuse me, this was a kind of progress, but it was also confusing. It helped obscure from many blacks and whites alike the true dangers being designed by repressive elements. In insignificant instances, what appeared to be progress was in fact the vehicle of danger itself. For example, black appointees to high office generally included men of some standing and or credibility in black communities. Without that fact, of course, the value of their appointments was greatly, greatly, if not totally, diminished. Appointees included such men as Robert C. Weaver as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, the first non-white member of any president's cabinet, Andrew Brimer, the first black governor of the Federal Reserve Board, Leslie C. Carter Jr., an Assistant Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, Theodore M. Berry, Community Action Director of the Office of Economic Opportunity, and of course, Thurgood Marshall as Solicitor General, the uh, then Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, both unprecedented. While the Black appointees were highly visible, they were, for the most part, powerless. Ooh! I, ooh. Do y'all, y'all feeling this? They were highly visible, but for the most part, powerless. <laughs> and we're told representation matters. Do we want representation or power? Let me keep reading. And their powerless visibility in and around the bureaucratic councils added an aura of legitimacy to illegitimate acts, providing a smoke screen for dirty dealing. These people are still doing this shit 50 years later. They just did it in the last election. We got a black woman as a vice president. Come on. Yeah, right. All right. This is neither to criticize nor exonerate the appointees. The fault was not theirs. The fault was in the system by design. Those who attribute the major fault to the appointees do so mainly out of their failure to grasp the cleverness and ruthlessness and the bureaucratic design to which these men were attached. This is not to say that those who hoped should not have hoped and that those who tried should not have done otherwise. When the 1960 decade began, there was every reason both hope and to try. This cycle of hope, lost hope, promise, aborted promise, then rank oppression began with the election in 1960 of Senator John F. Kennedy to the presidency. I, I hope y'all getting this. I hope y'all getting it. Yeah. Share, like the video, get people to come on, tune in. Let's tap in. This is good. What with the freedom rise in full swing and with black people singing a bold new song, what real choice had black people between candidate Richard Nixon, who, who had off concentration camp legislation, see part three, and a superbly glamorous young man who promised a great America moving again, right? When President Kennedy brought into the, into the White House, Andrew Hatcher, the first black White House assistant press secretary, that appointment serves to indicate that he was willing to hear a black man's story. Subsequently, he received at the White House the leaders of massive of a massive 1963 march on Washington for jobs and freedom. He promised those leaders, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., A. Philip Randolph, Whitney Young Jr., Roy Wilkins, and John Lewis, a new strategy to attack poverty and injustice. Less than four months later, President Kennedy was dead and the decade's first brief hope and promise had died with him. New hope and bigger promises nonetheless sprang up in their places. Kennedy's successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, offered his sequel. To President Kennedy's Let Us Begin, said President Johnson, let us continue. 
The Johnson promise, the Great Society, within a few months after President Kennedy was shot down in Dallas, November 22, 1963, President Johnson announced a new unconditional war on poverty and succeeded in getting an aggrieved Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, signed on July 2nd, and, cre and to create on August 20th, the Office of Economic Opportunity. I wonder what the Office of Economic Opportunity is now. Did it get folded up into something else? Where's the Office of Economic Opportunity? Because it's 2021 and we still need an Office of Economic Opportunity, okay? Beyond that, President Johnson made highly publicized speeches pledging to open doors for poor Blacks and to help them walk through those doors into a great society. Now we got Build Back Better. Hmm, they stay lying. Those were the promises of the great society. The floods of government promise and black hope both crested at the point in the mid 1960s, but slowly, almost imperceptibly, the glint began to wear from Uncle Sam's shiny new armor. It tarnished even while Uncle Sam stood like a colossus in the middle of the poverty and civil rights battlefield, swearing to take on all corners of the, on behalf of Negroes and the poor. Still early in that new day of hope, wary Negroes straining to see some sign of battle could not perceive the paralysis that stayed the federal giant. But as the day wore on, the go slow motions of the federal giant did not match the fast rhythmic rhetoric. In time, Negroes began to know that what they heard was aimed at them, not for them. OK, the cruelest hoax since the vain promise of the 20 acres on a mule or the 40 acres on a mule following the Civil War had been set in motion against Africans transplanted in America. The raised hand of Uncle Sam was swatting poor Negroes while rewarding rich whites with the spoils of black misery. Mm. I got to read that again. I'm sorry. y'all. This is this has got to come on. I got to read it again. Whew. Mm, mm, mm. It says, still early in that new day of the awareness stand that some sign of the background could not perceive the paralysis that stayed. Okay, no, let me go back and read this. It says, the raised hand of Uncle Sam was swatting poor Negroes while rewarding rich whites with the spoils of black misery. As this truth became known, hope turned to hatred. Dedication became disgust. Hands raised for help became clenched fists and eyes searching for acceptance toward inward. Negroes turned black. Blacks could see clearer what Negroes could not. If help would come, they themselves would have to bring it. Now, what have I been talking about for people who follow me on social media? What have I been talking about the last couple of days? I said, it is time for us to build, right? Mutual aid and benevolent societies again. This government has showed us they're not coming to save us. Ain't nobody coming to save us. It's time for us to start listening to the ancestors, listening to what the elders have been trying to tell us. They done wrote whole books on it, okay? You if you, you probably never heard of him because the book has been shadow banned, okay? This is a, a real talk with ZSJ where you get uncensored truth telling and I'm doing a reading of this book and this is just part one. I am wrapping up the introduction here and let me finish. It says, if help would come, they themselves would bring it. We got to take care of ourselves, y'all. Beauty was, was where they found it. Finding beauty meant being beautiful. They could win only if the system lost and vice versa. And what truly was at stake was their natural lives. And so it went, a decade of freedom rise, promises, public con game, Black rebellions, and armed invasions of campus sanctuaries even so, through it all, Blacks did manage more togetherness, whether it was in Vietnam or campsites on this side, the college campus, or at the wakes of the martyrs in jail cells or at the OEA community action boards. The Black togetherness of the 1960s, the newfound Blackness produced a new visibility and a grip on the issues affecting Black lives. Consequently, through a residue of confidence in the black in the political system, hundreds of blacks were elected to public office, but even some of them foresaw 
as the new decade began, concentration camps and oppression. Thus, if blacks, thus, even if blacks who hope most or and were most rewarded in the tradition of the system saw the nation's choice a clear and present danger. The schemes of the 1970s promised new martyrs, bigger jails, more wars at home and abroad, data banks, wiretaps, and a genuinely regimented society, including the sharp curtailment of black college students, a white establishment takeover of black colleges, psychological barbed wire all around learning institutions. In short, the 1970s promised a reversal of those processes that in the 1960s tended to bring black people a modicum of socioeconomic, socioeconomic advancement. In the 1970s for black Americans, it is clearly a question of survival. All right, this is part one now. It says a decisive decade, the 1960s. All right, chapter one, a plan to destroy obsolete people. I want y'all to see that. A plan to destroy obsolete people. All right. The murder of Dr. King tells Negroes that if one of the greatest among them is not safe from the assassin's bullet, then what can the least of them hope for? In this context, those young black militants who have resorted to violence feel vindicated. Look at what happened to Dr. King, they say. He was nonviolent. He didn't hurt anybody. And look what they did to him. If we have to go down, let's go down shooting. Let's take Whitey with us. Maynard Russell, the American Federalist, May 1968, page three. Interesting. Martin Luther King Jr. had been dead for exactly a week, and fresh fires still sprang up almost hourly, even during daylight and within blocks of the White House in the nation's capital. In the charred ruins of the Northwest Washington, a young black gangster, quote unquote, told how it was, what it was like to lose a leader he would not have followed. And yet why the murder had to be avenged, even at the risk of his own death. It killed a lot of hopes, said Spanky, raising his shades to look at the reporter with his natural eyes. Don't get me wrong, he went on, readjusting his shades. I don't necessarily say that I would have been in one of those nonviolent marches with him, but everybody knows that he was out there trying to work this thing out the right way. But after he was killed, I said, what's the issue? That's that. They ain't nothing left, man. A lot of people feel that way. All hope is gone now. Nobody's going to get out there like he did. Though still under 25, Spanky, which is not his real name, was a little older than most of his gang a little more mature too. Some who would say that he had less reason to loot, but loot he did and would again. And yet this manner was so quiet and orderly that it was hard to picture him looting and burning except when he described it. The other guys where I worked felt that the people down at the White House and the Capitol knew that this assassination was going to be done. You know, Same way with President Kennedy, same shit. Nobody feels that the real killer will be caught. Spanky was at work making more than $2 an hour when he heard of the assassination of Dr. King on the evening of April 4, 1968. He and his working partner left the job and headed to Washington, Northwest Washington's Northwest Corridor. They crashed a pawn shop window and loaded the trunk of their car with cameras and electric shavers. They set fire to the shop. They drove up and down the main drag, hitting their favorite targets, looting until the establishment was either empty or being approached by police. Then they set fire and moved on. He said, I can't explain it, you understand? But yeah, I felt good doing it. I felt that me participating in this for his cause, I don't mean that he would appreciate this violence, you understand, but I was because they killed him. I had to do something. I can't let Whitey get away with that. I think everybody felt that way. A lot of people just didn't care whether the police shot or anything else. Spanky said Washington had to be hit hard so Whitey would get the message. A lot of people through the con thought this kind of thing wouldn't happen in Washington, the nation's capital and all. No, it ain't over yet, Spanky said, and finding the assassin won't prevent further fire and looting. It wouldn't help much. It wouldn't bring him back, Dr. King. And besides, the man who did it couldn't be punished enough to satisfy me. And again, if they did get some cat, I ain't no, not sure if Whitey 
would, would get the right man. Spanky's distrust of Wiley was total, but even that was not his reason for looting and burning. The reason this whole bag establishment of system owes me something. It owes me something, he repeated again. A few years earlier, as Spanky described it, he was an above average student in a slum high school. His family had hoped to move from the slum, but his father died, leaving his mother with three other children. They were stuck. I really liked school, he said, without pretense. I was always anxious to get arithmetic lessons. But you remember about the time the gangs were bad, Jim, and they didn't like to make all, all those good grades. So they roughed me up and I had to join them for protection. Next thing I knew, I was on the corner more than I was in school. Then it got kind of good to me, you know, laying up with chicks and jiving around. I needed some change, so I got me a job. So this was where the bad thing happened. Of course, I think of my old man and had been living. I wouldn't be in this neighborhood and not be in school. But anyway, I was coming home from work one night and saw a couple of cats hitting on this chick for money. It was a woman that I didn't know, but I knew the cats from on the corner and I was going to rescue the chick. So while I was telling the cats not to do it, the cops came up, they ran. I didn't run nowhere because I knew that the woman would tell the cops that I was trying to help her. But the cops took me on down anyway and said they turned me loose if they found that it was like I said. They took the chick in one room and me in another. They beat my head with a black jacket, Jim, and told me that they would that they would make me tell who the other cats were. But I was mad as hell then. I wouldn't tell them if it killed me. This lawyer they gave me didn't believe me neither. And he kept telling me to cop out, confess, and get a lot of sentence. But I got out on bond while mother was trying to find me another lawyer. I went to church and asked the man upstairs for some help, you know. But I got a hung jury and the judge put some prejudice in it. He told the jury that if my trial was costing a lot of money and they went back and said that I was guilty, they owe me something. They owe me something. The boss of Spanky's gang entered the room and told him to scatter. He did. Little Like Spanky, Roy, not his real name, was an exceptional student and a dropout. But unlike Spanky, Roy almost never enjoyed going to school. His native intelligence was unquestionably of very high order. He was categorically direct in his speech, quick and thorough in his assessments, and exuded personal charm at the moment he deemed it appropriate. Still a teenager, he was younger than most of his associates, but nonetheless their leader. Did he loot and burn? Yes, of course, he said impatiently. His anger almost leaped from his finely chiseled face. Sensitive and intelligent, he was well-versed on the good life afforded to some in America and had decided that he would rather die young than be left out. Hmm. Dr. King was a Negro trying to do something for us. They made a great mistake in killing him. I was hurt, bad, but they made us realize that white is trying to, what white is trying to do. I had believed Stokely and rap for a long time, but now I know that what they say is true. We built Whitney's country, Whitey's country. Now he wants to kill us. Would Whitey really do such a thing? Would he systemically kill off Negroes or place them in concentration camps? Roy sat up straight and adjusted his cuffs on his shirt sleeves which had the same effect for him as mounting a stage. I believe the white man would do this, he said carefully. I believe this is worth dying for. To stop him, I will burn this country down. This is my country. If I can't have it, then nobody can. Whitey brought us over here and we built this country. It's as much mine as it is his. I'll burn it down if I can't have it. Roy, fierce pride helped force him out of school. Force helped force him out of school while he was still in junior high school. My mother died and left the bunch of us with my father. He's just a laborer. He couldn't take care of us. I'd go to school with torn pants. People could see my ass. I didn't even have no shoes at all sometimes. People wanted to give us things, but I don't want nobody giving me a damn thing. So I didn't like school. I had to start some kind of hustle. Like other teenagers, Roy was pained by the draft. He was angry at the likelihood that he would be called soon. I'm not going to any war, he said in the near shop. It's not my war any more than the World War II was my daddy's war. What the hell did he get out of it, right? Bad health and a hole to dig. 
Stokely's right. Hell no, I ain't going to Vietnam. Roy admitted that he was not a pacifist, nor even nonviolent. But would he have marched with Dr. King? Yes, I would have marched with him. And I would have been nonviolent for a while, you know, until some white man did something I didn't appreciate. I admire that man. I didn't dig his ways because I don't want to wait 400 years for my rights. I really feel hurt behind the fact that they killed that man. When I heard they killed Dr. King, I wanted to go out and kill me a couple of white men. I think death is too good for the man who did it. I believe there's a whole lot of people in it. The assassination reason, Roy, because of $100,000 reward money, any white man would tell on his mama. If he's crazy enough to do it, he's crazy enough to want to tell somebody about it. He's doing it for recognition or money. The most honest man in the world would talk for $100,000. So the guys who did it don't need the money. That means they're doing well in politics or somewhere else. He's got to be the big man, just like the man that got Kennedy. The good life, Roy envisioned, includes love and family, a home, but it takes money to live the good life. When this man, Uncle Sam, asked me to go to the army, it insults me. He thinks I'm a fool. We go to war here. He talks about communism. What does he think this is? This is hell. It's a bitch. I, a fellow wants to get married to a broad and he's tired of stealing, you understand? But he's got no education, no money, you dig? So if I got married, she'd have to be making more money than me. Roy riffed painfully in his chair. We are inferior to our women because the white man likes our women and he gives her a break. Look at me, he said, pointing to this thick tan arms. I wouldn't be this damn color if the white man hadn't been fucking around with our women. So he gets the break. She goes to school. She's smarter than you. She should be the man and you the woman lying home and having the babies. No, Roy said, almost in tears. This disturbance ain't over. This white man has made a savage out of me. The only way I can survive is to kill, hustle, and step on people. I don't want to do that, but I have to survive. What Roy called black survival congressional member of the House Un-American Activities Committee called Guerrilla Warfare. When Roy regarded as avengers of the martyr's death, the House Un-American Activities Committee, a standing committee in the U.S. House of Representatives, regarded as black guerrilla fighters. And three weeks later, under the chairmanship of Representative Edwin E. Ellis, a Louisiana Democrat, a Louisiana Democrat, the committee recommended to President Johnson a plan by which such black citizens could be isolated and destroyed in a short period of time. Woo, are y'all listening? They said that they're going to destroy us. Guerrilla warfare, as envisioned by its proponents at this stage, would have to have its base in the ghetto. This being the case, the ghetto would have to be sealed off from the rest of the city. Police state troopers and the National Guard could adequately handle this chore. And if they needed help, the regular army would be brought into service. Wow. Once the ghetto is sealed off and depending upon the violence. Okay, do y'all realize this was a Democrat, Edwin E. Willis, a Louisiana Democrat that suggested this on the, he was the chair of the House Un-American uh, uh, Committee in the House of Representatives, and this is what he wanted to do to black people, a Democrat. I just want y'all to pay attention now. This is 1971. Being perpetuated by guerrillas, the following actions could be taken by the authorities. Listen, a curfew would be imposed in the enclosed isolated area. No one would be allowed out or in the area after sundown, sundown towns again, okay, to black people. During the night, the authorities would not only patrol the boundary lines, but would also attempt to control the streets and, if necessary, send out foot patrols through the entire area. If the guerrillas attempted to either break out of the area or engage the authorities in open combat, they would be readily suppressed. During a guerrilla uprising, most civil liberties would have to be suspended. Search and seizure operations would be instituted during the daylight hours, and anyone found armed or without proper identification would immediately be arrested. Most of the people in the ghetto would not be involved in guerrilla operations and under conditions of police and military control. Some would help and 
and to fettering out the guerrillas, their help would be invaluable. If the guerrillas were able to hold out for a period of time, then the population of the ghetto would be classified through an out through the office of the control and organization of inhabitants. This office would distribute census cards, which would bear a photograph of the individual, the letter of the district in which he lives, his house and street number, and a letter designated to his home city. This classification would aid the authorities in knowing the exact location of any suspect and who is in control of any given district. Under such a system, movement would be prescribed and the ability of the guerrilla to move freely from place to place seriously curtailed. The population within the ghetto would be exhorted to work with the authorities and to report both on guerrillas and any suspicious activity they might know. The police agencies would be in position to make immediate arrests without warrants. Listen to this without warrants under suspension of guarantees usually provided by the constitution. Number six, acts of violence by the guerrillas would mean that they have declared a state of war within the country and therefore would forfeit their rights as in wartime. The McCarran Act provides for various detention centers to be operated throughout the country and these might well be utilized for the temporary imprisonment of warring guerrillas. Number seven, the very nature of the guerrilla operation as presently envisioned by certain communists and black nationalists would be impossible to sustain. According to the most knowledgeable guerrilla war experts in this country and, re and the revolutionaries could be isolated and destroyed in a short period of time. Mm. Like any U.S. president since passage of the Internal Security Act of 1950, President Johnson could have taken the action recommended by the House Un-American Activities Committee without any consultation of Congress and upon lesser provocation than the uprisings following the Dr. King's death. President Johnson, however, chose not to take the recommended action. Well, we thank you, President Johnson, for not doing that. But that was a choice delayed, not necessarily canceled. Such action might await riper circumstances a new cast of possible executioners and a societal conditions which would facilitate it, right? In short, such a choice would require such conditioning as is possible only under more complete police state. A fuller rationale, a scapegoat syndrome would be required. Both of these would have to precede the execution of a liquidation plan on the order and scale proposed by the House Un-American Activities Committee. However, a de facto police state and a rationale were achieved by mid-1970. By that time, legislation of the police state and selective liquidations, particularly of the Black Panther Party members, had already begun. The obsolescence of Blacks in America and their will to survive nobly demanded the fight for their rights, provide some with an adequate rationale of black extinction, legal sanctions for the systemic invasions of black sanctuaries, homes, schools, and establishments were signed into law before Congress adjourned for fall 1970 elections. But in America, as in Asia, these essentially military measures bespoke the failure of insincere or basically unsound efforts to help black people, right? I'm gonna read one more chapter and then we're gonna um, call it a night. Chapter two, the great society pacification programs. I think this is really important, these pacification programs. Let me um, take a drink. Thank y'all for hanging in here with me. I really hope y'all are enjoying this book. This book again um, is out of print. It's very hard to find, I think, there's on Amazon for $700. Absolutely ridiculous. And I hope that you all are enjoying this content. This is part one. I intend to read the whole book so that it will be out there and people can understand that uh, Black people have been working for justice for years. And, and this current movement, um, without, the in, without the influence of what our ancestors have already laid out for us in historical documents, 
um, we need to go back and revisit. We need the Sankofa. And that's why I'm reading this book. So chapter two, uh, make sure y'all like the video and share the video on your social media platforms, please. And invite your friends to come on in and listen to this. This is good. True to his promise to the leaders of the August 28, 1963 March for Jobs and Freedom, President Kennedy ordered federal agencies to begin studies into, to, wait a minute. Okay, true to his promise to the leaders of August 20, 1963 March for Jobs and Freedom, President Kennedy ordered federal agencies to begin studies into the problems of civil rights and poverty. The fate he met only a few months later might have been the first stern warning that the controlling forces in America would pay any price to deny the choice President Kennedy symbolized. On an unforgettable Friday afternoon in November, the president died cruelly and almost too suddenly for comprehension. In Alabama, some white school children cheered the murder as, as regards, have y'all ever heard that? That some school children in Alabama cheered the murder of uh, President Kennedy? I had never heard of that. And now, so anyway, let me finish reading. As regards the destiny of the black poor, the swift and symbolic destruction of the Kennedy administration has served notice on two points. An equitable solution to socioeconomic oppression would have to be found, or violence and death would have, would have to put an end to the aspirations for change. And two, the initial choice had been violence and death. On the day before his final trip, President Kennedy told his new ambassador to Finland, Carl Rowan, and I quote, Carl, a lot has happened in the six months you've been out of Washington. Hatred is spreading across the country like a cancer. The bigots, the birth sheets are like a plague. They get bolder every day. I suppose you read about the disgraceful things that they did to Adela Stevenson down in Texas. This trend is dangerous for the country. It endangers you, me, and human rights all, all at this point, all and all that this administration stands for. I have made up my mind that a president is obligated to use the prestige of his office to try to halt this damn madness. I have concluded that I am partly to blame because I haven't got out among the people enough. I'm going to Texas tomorrow, partly because I believe it is something I am obligated to do. The legacy of the assassination is a staggering fact that a president had been slain in broad daylight in the view of thousands and neither was anyone ever placed on trial for the deed nor did any of those directly accused at the time live to tell any coherent details of their involvement or information. The central message was hard to miss. High-level vigilante action had began to replace due process in America. Such action began with justice to a president and had only one way to go from there, downward to the rest of the people. But President Johnson moved quickly to map out the regions to which his predecessor had merely pointed. My good friends and my fellow Americans, he stated in his State of the Union message, January 8, 1964, in these last seven sorrowful weeks, we have learned anew that nothing is so endearing as faith and nothing is so degrading as hate. John Kennedy was a victim of hate, but he was also a great builder of faith. Faith in our fellow Americans, whatever their creed or color or their station in life, faith in the future of man, whatever his divisions and differences. Earlier in that message to Congress, President Johnson had announced that there were to become not the progressive actions he called for, but the two major holding actions of the decade, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the so-called War on Poverty. Let this session of Congress be known as a session which did more for civil rights than the last hundred sessions combined, as the session which declared all out war on human poverty and unemployment in these United States, we have in 1964, a unique opportunity and obligation to prove success of our system, to disprove the cynics and critics at home and abroad who question our purpose, our competence, 
But President Johnson also touched on the historical flaw of efforts towards sustained socioeconomic progress in America, the fact of color and racism. Unfortunately, many Americans live on the outskirts of hope, some because of their poverty and some because of their color, and all too many because of both. Our task is to help to replace their despair. Let me make the principle of this administration abundantly clear. All of these increased opportunities in employment, in education, in housing, and in every field must be open to Americans of every color. As far as the writ of federal law will run, we must abolish not some, but all racial discrimination. Despite that rhetoric, however, President Johnson's unconditional war on poverty never became a general war. Except in the rhetoric itself, it was never intended to be. At best, it was a kind of bureaucratic and political civil war. The rhetoric and occasional, and occasional good intentions aside, the effect of it all was mainly to further the establishment war against those in society already defeated. The Office of Employment Opportunity, in fact, would become a new vehicle for Black oppression at white profit. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. President Kennedy had taken official notice of Black discontent. President Johnson would move to pacify it. Ain't that what Democrats do? Even to this day. Even to this day, family. Let me wrap this up. I'm going to read this chapter and then we're going to come back at another time. So these are two choices other than, there are two choices other than pacification. One is liberation. The other is liquidation. Of the three, only liberation is honest. Pacification delays liquidation, but stops far short of liberation. The 1960s was a decade of decision. Conflicts built into free enterprise and the U.S. political fabric prohibited the liberation of colonized blacks in America and yet in their private consciousness, many white Americans regarded liquidation as too extreme and immoral, if not un-American. Thus, in the 1960s, a period of black liberation struggles wavered between liberation and liquidation and became a decade of pacification, giving rise to two major pacification programs, the Office of Economic Opportunity and the collection of civil rights measures spearheaded by the Civil Rights Act of 1964, okay? In the ghettos, as in Southeast Asia, the need for pacification rises out of a history of colonization, the economic and cultural exploitation of a subject group, and honest determination to relinquish such exploitation would obviate any need to pacify. Schemes short of this determination, however, merely attempt to calm and contain exploited groups while the schemes provide a cover for extending the exploitation, tightening control, and generally furthering the unworthy aims of the colonists. Mm. Under such a scheme, the U.S. State Department Chief Pacification Agency, what? Did y'all know that the US, United States State Department had a chief pacification agency? The Agency for International Development, or AID, operates in such neutral, they put neutral in quotes, countries as Laos. In a radio interview with Metro Media reporter Dan Blackburn on June 5th, 1970, an aid administrator, and, uh, I'm sorry, aid administrator, Dr. John A. Hanna, was forced to admit that aid was a cover operation for the Central Intelligence Agency. Ooh, no wonder why they banned this book. Y'all feel me? I gotta read that again. This is chapter two. Under such a scheme, the US State Department's Chief Pacification Agency, the Agency for International Development, AID, operates in such neutral countries as Laos. That's in Southeast Asia for people who don't know. In a radio interview with Metro Media reporter Dan Blackburn on June 5th, 1970, aid administrator Dr. John A. Hanna was forced to admit that aid was a cover operation 
for the Central Intelligence Agency or the CIA in Laos under the guise of assisting Laotians with development of agricultural hospitals and other benefits, AIDS pacification programs in Vietnam and Cambodia were similarly implicated in the interview. Domestic pacification programs are basically identical to those in Laos and elsewhere. Distinguishing features include the fact that pacification is a game which cleverly continues and oppressors options, but is limited by the resourcefulness and, uh, hold on just a second, I need to grab my uh, charger, just a second. Thanks y'all for patiently waiting. Sorry about that. Definitely didn't want to. Um, okay. Because this is good, y'all. It's getting good. All right. So here we go. All right. Domestic pacification. This is important. The domestic pacification programs. You can best believe all this shit is still happening today. Best believe it. Hold on. What is this? Sorry. Okay. Here we go. Domestic pacification programs are basically identical to those in Laos and elsewhere. Distinguishing features include the fact that pacification is a game which cleverly continues an oppressor's options, but is limited by the resourcefulness and alertness of the oppressed and their determination to be truly free. Thus, unsuccessful pacifications in Indochina were followed by military intervention and wars of attrition. And thus, the House Un-American Activities Committee planned to destroy Black citizens came in 1968 after two major pacification programs ceased to beguile the Black power, I'm sorry, the Black poor, and failed to contain their liberation struggle. If y'all don't think that we still got pacification programs going on today in 2021, you're fooling yourself. The man was trying to warn us about what was really going on, the Trojan horse. The Great Society pacification programs then must be judged as failures, both in the honesty of their design and in their truer aims of placating people justly aroused. I'm sorry, let me pause again. We go through this every four years when it comes to the election. They're doing it now in Georgia, right? Vote, vote, get out and vote. The pacification all you got to do is get two more Democrats in there and we're going to get what we need, right? But what's happening now is that more people like in the 60s and 70s are starting to question that because it's been 50 years and y'all still telling us the same thing, right? Mm -mm. The Great Society pacification programs then must be judged as failures, both in the honesty of their designs and in their truer aims of placating people just justly aroused. In view of their maximum goals, the funds and personnel provided and the authority to do the job, the OEO and civil rights program did not let relinquish the original aims of white establishment exploitation. They left ultimate control and financial benefits with the colonists. <laughs> Yes, they did. They still do. Not with the colonized, nor even were control and profit shared equitably between them. It would be difficult to overestimate the importance of these pacification failures. They represent a kind of last ditch effort to delay an ultimate choice regarding the disposition of Black citizens, their aspirations, and their history of incipient genocide. I see why. Ooh, they, they fired him for this book, baby. The cause and manner of these cataclytic failures in pacification became an essential part of understanding what lies ahead. Like pacifications elsewhere, 
Pacifications in the black U.S. colonies tended in reality to strengthen the options of the colonizer, tighten control and earn him profits. By mid 1970, the status of major pacification programs began in 1964, clearly indicated that the colonizer had achieved these advantages. The job corps, that billion dollar program that promised to rescue poor teenagers with training and jobs instead being an economic boom to the poor, instead of being an economic boom to the poor, became an alternative base for the military industrial complex. <laughs> Not a vehicle for getting boys into labor unions, but a major source of major source of boy power for Vietnam. Not a reasonably priced, soundly based training course for existing jobs but the basis for a new educational industrial complex, a place for the conglomerates to dump their worthless gadgets at inflated prices. And instead of providing campsites for wholesome surroundings, a conservation programming, the job court camps, when 59 of them were closed during 1969, became ready-made concentration camps, places for the human scrap heaps of the unskilled, the unconnected, and those Blacks unwilling to, and those Black ones to stop procreating and demonstrating in a society that neither cared about their problem nor wanted any more of their kind. The Community Action Program, that still exists, it's called a Community Action Partnership. Now, a billion dollar con game about involvement pledged maximum feasible participation of the black and poor in local decision-making, but actually became a name-taking web that helped identify and isolate the natural leaders of every black community in America. Each leader's name ultimately fixed to a massive pickup list at the Pentagon awaiting the movement, awaiting the movement when the order is given. Volunteers in Service of America or VISTA the so-called Domestic Peace Corp, sprinkled throughout the poor black neighborhoods enough spies among the sincere workers to keep tabs not only on the number of players in Harlem, for example, but also in-depth information on any and all new thought, plan, or development, any strategies blacks might devise to aid in their own defense. Do you hear this? Do y'all hear this? The VISTA program, the so-called Domestic Peace Corps, sprinkled throughout the poor Black neighborhoods enough spies <laughs> among the sincere workers to keep tabs, not only on the numbers of players in Harlem, for example, but also in-depth information on any and all new thought. These people want to know what we think plan or development, any strategies Blacks might devise to aid in their own defense. <laughs> it was understandable then that in 1967, when police began accurate raids on lottery operations in Harlem, residents complained that Vista worker Lawrence Rockefeller mm, had his nerve sending cops on them while his uncle, New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, was urging public support of the state's multi-million dollar lottery to finance education. I have to pause here because my great my grandfather, my mother's father, was a number runner in New York City um, during this time. He actually um, was murdered, but he he was a so-called number runner uh, in New York City, uh, Rockefeller. And so that's what they was up to, my grandfather. Mm. Head Start, a program to give deprived preschoolers a better chance to compete with rich kids by first grade, was perverted into a white Southern strategy for prolonging school segregation. Throughout America, it became the forerunner of the new scheme for documenting in various studies the inferior learning capability of deprived Black children. <laughs> Beyond the OEO programs or the Office of Employment Opportunity Programs, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 requires equal opportunity in hiring. But the government admittedly handed out multi-million dollar defense contracts 
to Southern textilers in violation of the existing civil rights laws. And the Nixon administration chose to demonstrate its interest in fair hiring by pitting black and civil rights groups against their only consistent well-financed ally, the labor unions. Divide and conquer still works like magic, baby. In a year-end editorial, the December 30th, 1969 edition of the Washington Afro-American Observe, President Nixon took a firm stand in favor of the Philadelphia plan drawn up by Assistant Secretary of Labor, Art Fletcher. He named the names, y'all. The plan aims at forcing federal contractors in the construction business to hire more black workers, in fact, to require this. Pressure by the White House convinced Congress to accept the Philadelphia plan. Two questions though are obvious. Hmm. One is whether or not this was another ploy of the Nixon administration to set civil rights leaders and labor leaders at odds since labor did not want the Philly, the Philly plan. The second is, why should black citizens expect President Nixon to enforce this contract requirement when he has done such a lousy job on federal contracts handed out to Dixie, Dixie firms and others that violate discriminatory hiring and promotion standards? In one instance, Bethlehem Steel in Baltimore, Mr. Nixon has not backed Mr. Fletcher in getting the necessary conformity but the federal funds keep flowing. They keep flowing. Listen to it. Come on. Few motives are more enduring than the profit motive in pacification. Always present in the purchase, the contract and grant phase of the Office of Economic Opportunity, financial interest also dominated the major titles of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title uh, IV offers federal money for local white school districts to learn how to desegregate. Title VI, I'm sorry, yeah, Title VI would cut off funds to schools which did not desegregate. That is to say, they would receive federal money if they obeyed the law. Title VII would gradually require employers, particularly those receiving federal contracts, to cease discriminatory hiring upon compliance or an effort at legal compliance, they could sit at the federal trough. The OEO became headquarters for the war on poverty. Sergeant Shriver, a former Peace Corps director and brother-in-law of President Kennedy, was named by President Johnson as the first OEO director. Shriver's first statement following the funding of the OEA, I'm sorry, the OEO on October 8, 1964, could have been a warning of how revolutionary this war would be. It was not widely interpreted so at that time, but in retrospect, Shriver's initial statement was an eloquent statement of profit-motivated, insincere pacification. Mm. These, these are the white liberals, okay? These are the people that we think are our friends. This is, this, they still, they still doing this and we still falling for it. A lot of us are. This program not only starts a war against poverty, but a campaign for opportunity, opportunity for the poor people of America. This is not a relief program. There isn't going to be any cash mailed out. There isn't, there isn't going to be a dole. There is no handout here. The only thing we're giving is a new chance, a new opportunity for self-help. We're offering a chance for 1 million poor people who are young men and women out of school and out of work, we're offering a new chance for the aged, for mothers on relief, for fathers who can't get a job. 78% of these poor are white. The majority live in depressing urban slums. They prefer work over charity. They prefer a new chance most of all. We're not taking cash from the rich to give to the poor. We're going to be sharing what most of us have the chance to do our best. And we're going to be sharing that with all Americans. Indeed, OEO would not take cash from the rich to give to the poor. The opposite would more likely be true. There was seldom voice but strong feeling among many whites at the OEO that the anti-poverty efforts was something they were doing for poor blacks. 
Permitting a black person to participate, they felt, was permitting an, a usurpation of the rights of the rich, well-motivated whites. Because the OEO had the responsibility, though not the authority, to coordinate the efforts of all federal agencies toward the elimination of poverty, the OEO task force was studded with interagency representatives, all white. They included Labor Assistant Secretary Daniel P. Moynihan, y'all remember him, right? Deputy Undersecretary of Agriculture, James Sundquist, Peace Corps Latin America Regional Director, Frank Makowitz, and second in command to Shriver, Adam Yormakowski, Special Assistant to Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara. Non bureaucrats on the task force included private industry uh, store. I'm sorry, hold on. Private Industries, C. Virgil Martin of Carson, Pre Scott and Company, Department Store Donald Pre of Avis Rental Car, and Litton Industries, Charles B. Tex Thornton. It also included authors Michael Harrington, The Other America, Edgar May, The Wasted Americans, and professional liberal Hyman bookbinder. From the beginning of the OEO, military, military, uh, let me see, military and industrial interests were prominently represented, but not blacks or the poor. While it competed with a strong, nobulous, ob obliged undertone that preferred no blacks at all, the selection of black appointees to the OEO administrative and policy job was as always an art unto itself. For what the appointment manager sought were classic anomalies, black men who were really white, oh, come on, bright men who were stupid, honest men whose honor was flexible, strong men who at the appropriate moment were weak. Fortunately, this generally was not what the personnel czars found. Nevertheless, the system did succeed often enough to reveal three of its essential goals in the selection and appointment of black talent. Number one, to provide color credibility wherever such credibility was crucial to selling an otherwise invalid product. Number two, to neutralize such talent by taking it from potentially radical stations, the hiring off of militants, Ooh, they still doing that and placing it officially on the side of the establishment, a technique not unlike president's nationalizing of the National Guard unit to prevent its misuse, disuse or proper use by a governor. And number three, to have a black person in position to take responsibility for anti-black policies and decisions usually made exclusively by whites without the black appointees knowledge, consent or ability. I'm sorry, y'all. This is crazy. And, it, and because it's still happening. I'm going to read number three again. To have a black person in position to take responsibility for anti-black policies and decisions usually made exclusively by whites without the black appointee's knowledge, consent, or ability. These people are still doing this today. More than anyone else, Yamalansky, the man Shriver wanted as his deputy, was the chief architect of the job corps. Another prominent voice of the OEO task force was John Rubel, a former Pentagon aide, but then a fast rising star in Thornton's gigantic conglomerate, Litton Industries, a major defense contractor. Asked in those early days why he surrounded himself with so many industrialists, Shriver replied, they have good judgment. It would not be fair to say that Shriver involved in only industrialists in OEO planning, but it is obvious that the council of these magnets with good judgment went along. Y'all, this is crazy. Indeed, it was... It was they who eventually walked away with the lion's share of the money the black poor was told coming to them. 
These same games are played today, family. And we and then we turn around and we blame the victim. Well, we started this program. We started that program. We did this and the government has did this. But it's, it was our brother who broke it down. He broke down the Trojan horse about where the money really went. This is why this book is so important. Indeed, it was they who eventually walked away with a lion's share of the money the black poor was told to come into them. It went to these industrialists in the form of multi-million dollar contracts to deliver not jobs, but employability training to jobs, courts, and royalties. So they didn't even give them jobs. They gave them training. for mo Back then, multi-million dollar contracts, which will be multi-billion dollar contracts today. The same game is being played. A favorable report on the big business gamut was presented in the pro-business trade journal, Business Management. The January 1966 issue of the publication reported that the fate occupied nearly two years after the fact, probably the most visible evidence of industry's attack on public problems lies in the job course program. Last year, the Office of Economic Opportunity began letting contracts to operate the first 75 job corps retraining centers for disadvantaged young men and women. The contracts were quickly snapped up by such companies as Burrow Corps, ITT, Philco, Packard Bell Electronics, Xerox, IBM, Westinghouse, Airbrake, Litton Industries, and the U.S. Industries. In fact, with as many as 12 or more training centers, contracts to be let by, let by, July, by next July, there's even a waiting list of the companies. Not surprisingly, right? Not surprisingly. Oh, Lord, this makes me angry reading this. Thomas Watson of IBM, Thornton of Lytton, and Sol Len Lenowitz of Xerox, and others among the major contractors were members of the OEO's Business Leadership Advisory Council. That's a conflict of interest. So they're getting a multi-million dollar contract, plus they own the advisory council. <laughs> Stop blaming our people, man. While they might well have been in the poverty business to perform a public service, they came to that endeavor with guaranteed fixed profits of four to six percent, plus a broad vested interest in the success of pacification, right? All of this was about pacification and making white folks rich, the great society. The financial payoff was not so much in the profit guarantees, modest compared to defense contracts, but in the hardware and the software capability and markets developed while using job course trainees as guinea pigs. Ooh, what they doing today? What are they doing today? Huh? Neither the poor nor any other group not locked into the socio-military industrial complex ever had the slightest chance of siphoning capital gains from the job course and related big money programs. Although the OEO press releases boasted that job course trainees were able to uh, send home part of their modest allotment to their needy parents and guardians, these sums were small pensions, small pensions from job corps budgets which pour millions into big business coffers. In 1966, Job Corps contributed $6 million directly and an equal amount indirectly to the families of needy enrollees. The $12 million was undoubtedly helpful to the poor families, but the Job Corps direct contribution, $6 million, was less than single contracts awarded to each of the several blue chip military industrialists. For example, in fiscal year 1968, the industrialists hauled off contracts in these amounts, semicolon, Linden Industries for the Camp Parks in California, 15.9 million. Federal Electric, a subsidiary of International Telephone and Telegraph for Camp Kilmer in New Jersey, 10 million. Graflix Incorporated, a subsidiary of General Precision Equipment Incorporated for Camp 
Bring Gas in Kentucky, 9.7 million. Burroughs Corporation for the Omaha Job Corps Center in Nebraska, 8 million. The Fickle Chemical Corporation for the Clearfield Center in Utah, 6.8 million. For the Tongue Point Center in Oregon, 6.3 million. And Westinghouse for the Camp Atterbury in Indiana, $6.3 million. He names the names and he's got it all documented. All of it, you can go back and find it in the historical record. This is what happened. Although the numbers fluctuated slightly from 1964 to 1969, about 25 out of the 110 job court centers were run by the private sector. An indication of substantial profit incentives from the outset. The others are run by such public agencies as the Forest Service of the Department of Agriculture, a few state agencies, and several bureaus within the Department of Interior Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Sports Fisheries, and Wildlife Bureau of Indi Indian Affairs, Bureau of Land Management, and the National Park Service, okay? A few of the private sector contractors are nonprofit. The Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, the, on, the only basically black group nonprofit or otherwise among the contractors running job course centers, the Texas Education Foundation and the National Board of the YWCA, and to the extent that they can be considered nonprofit, several universities. Although the public agencies operated more centers, their centers were small and handled comparatively few enrollees. Consequently, two-thirds two of the enrollees pass through the big centers run by the giant profit-making corporations. One of the first job court profit makers to sign up was Thornton Multifaceted Linton Industries, which on April 26, 1965, hauled in a two-year $13.4 million contract to operate Camp Park's in Pleasanton, California. Parks with, the, with its 2,300 enrollees is a larger than all except the state-sponsored 3,000 enrollee Gary Center in St. Marcus, Texas. The big industry centers literally span the country. For example, AFCO Economic Systems Corporation, a big defense contractor, operates job course centers both in Maine, on the East Coast, and in the westernmost state of Washington. Westinghouse Learning Corporation Camp Atterbury in Edinburgh, Indiana, had 1,600 enrollees. Graphics Incorporated won the 1,900 enrollee Camp Breckenridge in Morganfield, Kentucky, from Southern Illinois University. The Thickle Chemical Company broadly diversified by taking on the 1,300 enrollee Clearfield Center in Utah and Federal Electric won the 1700 capacity Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, in the first round of the contract, February 11, 1965. At the height of the socio commercial enterprise, other centers were run by the Science Research Associates, a subsidiary of Thomas Watson's IBM, RCA, U.S. Industries, and Northern Natural Gas. For reasons to be discussed later, these centers were ordered closed, vociferous lobbying notwithstanding. The job course was literally the ideal vehicle for this ultra capitalist venture of super business to the rescue of the imperiled poor. Had there already been job court in some equitable form, the industrialists would surely have used it. But having a chance to influence its inception was immeasurably more advantageous. While Jan Malinsky is credited with designing the job court, perhaps no single individual had more influence on both the job court concept and its tie-in with the industry than Rubel of Littman. Like Jan Malinsky, Rubel was present at the first meeting of the OEO task force. And like Jan Malinsky, Rubel was a Pentagon veteran. Both Jan Malinsky and Rubel had a chance to share the intellectual stimulation of economist sociologist Moynihan while the three served on the task force. For a good measure, Pentagon boss McNamara 
had once been an aide to Lytton Thornton while both Thornton and McNamara were at the Ford Motor Company. These very influences meshed reasonably well on the memorandum Rubel sent to Shriver in the Job Corps' formulative days as big business made its move. I think the Job Corps as a complex transforming machine with many internal parts, the input, the raw material that is fed into the machine is people. The output is people. It is the function of this machine to transform these people. Here we have a new government echelon aimed at altering the behavior of a class of people that isn't being duplicated elsewhere. The programs of the OEO offer the country a chance of creating a new environment for these people and thus modifying their own present inadequate social behavior. It won't happen all at once, sure, but the knowledge gained in the behavioral sciences may bring pocketbook benefits to everybody, including business. Thus, two years later, in the fall of 1967, the profits of Fickle Chemical Corporation were typical of those realized by the big job court military contractors. Fickle's $11.2 million contract was set at 4.8% profit. Under the headline, Fickle Sales Soar, on August 4, 1967, Trenton Evening News reported, Fickle Chemical Corporation reports earnings of 68 cents per share for the first six months of the year, sales totaling $122,522,385. This compares with the earnings of 65 cents per share and sales of $89,217,453 for the like period of 1966. The major portion of the increase in the sales and earnings resulted from production of flares and related devices at the company's Longhorn division, Marshall, Texas, and from the operation of the Job Corps Training Center in Clearfield, Utah. Fickle decided to get into the poverty business after losing its defense contract for development of a big solid fuel booster rockets. Like other contractors, Fickle found the poverty education route to an attractive avenue for ensuring profits, but also like others who turned to this fallback position, Fickle found need to both explain its altruism, why it costs so much to exercise it. Fickle's vice president for economic development, Robert L. Marquette, put it this way. People say the job corp is too expensive. Public schools educate youngsters for $500 to $800 per pupil, while job corps costs run $6,000 each. Sure, conventional education works for the average middle-class youngster, but the other 20%, the depraved, the deprived 20%, it just plain doesn't. The regular school system is not adequate for the kids without the right functional and intelligence quotient. Industry and OEO can take a boy any day of the week and put the boy through a process to a progress program and succeed if he's willing to stick to it. We are doing it. So is Lytton, Avco, and RCA. While most of the contractors were knowing enough to hire at least enough Blacks to satisfy the cosmetic requirements for credibility among Black corpsmen, it is nonetheless true that not one contractor was sub sub subjected to a civil rights compliance review as legally required. <laughs> Shriver and the OEO management legal apparatus simply would not permit it. And Shriver generally succeeded in delaying a confrontation on the issue. But the profit splash of big business into social programming was not without critical observers. In his comprehensive look at the business role in the great society, for example, journalist Gerald Turhos reported, other criticisms of the business approach to social programs is being heard around the country. ITT, it is charged, picked up its $11.5 million job for contract at Camp Kilmer merely, merely 
as a part of diversification policy that led to led it to acquire Avis Incorporated several months later. And despite their professed commitments to social change, Linton, Philco, and other companies have been accused in some quarters of sermonizing all the way to the bank. Shriver's office, and indeed the White House itself, is being criticized for promising an attack on the causes of poverty while merely attacking its effects, the educational and behavioral inadequacies of the unemployed. Eli Ginsberg, a Columbia University manpower specialist, has taken the position that the object of Job Corps should be to train people for specific jobs, not to improve their employability. Perhaps lucrative contracts to run Job Corps Center should alone have answered Rubel's vision of corporate-sized profits, but the growth factor, experimentation, and production gimmicks only began there. Profit, profitable though they were, running the centers was merely a foot in the door for one for once inside OEA, OEO officially invited Job Corps contractors to develop new instructional techniques and materials to help the enrollees become more employable. This was an invitation to develop the software and hardware which would produce the profit windfalls more characteristic of military industrialists. They were further invited to establish consortiums between business and universities and later on with the education establishment at all levels to further experimentation and develop materials. All such experimentation and development would be, would be with guaranteed profits, of course, the entry of these industrial giants into the non-traditional field of social improvement occurred ostensibly to fulfill needs Moynihan had documented. He put documented in quotes. What these giants of industry set out to do then was to make black youth in particular and other deprived youngsters more employable, the OEO said. In essence, the theme was education and training, not jobs. Nothing done by the OEO reversed or even moderated black exclusion by trade unions. In reality, the twofold design was rather to, number one, establish an economic base in the education system, and number two, accommodate poor youth in the military machine while getting them off the streets away from picket lines and other points of possible confrontation. But education was the password, as Turholz further observed. A new partnership between government and business is evolving that may bring about profound social change in American life. The vast technical and managerial resources of the big defense and aerospace firms are being put to use in an attack on social problems that range from poverty and crime to water pollution and transportation. Elected politicians and government administrators are leading the way and business is going along willingly and for profit. The, co the collaboration is already a reality in the Job Corps program of the Office of Economic Opportunity. And while technocratic dangers exist and may well increase in such a partnership, there is every indication that private corporations will increasingly carry out programs now assumed to be the sole prerogative of the bureaucratic agencies of the government. Although the overriding reason for this shift in corporate activity is a reduction in defense and space spending. There are other explanations. One is that the service industries in contrast with manufacturing are genuinely, I'm sorry, generally viewed by economists as the growth industries of the future. And among the service industries, education is the fastest growing of all. The government industry education establishment cycle of billion dollar funding was a hand in glove situation. Such the Office of Economic Opportunity involvement was by no means limited to Job Corps. Neither, moreover, was the government's generosity to business and their joint subversion of the school establishment, even primarily managed by the OEO. 
True, by fiscal year 1967, only two years after the first Job Corps contract was let, was let in, 18 firms was running 23 Job Corps centers to the tune of $105 million, 522,711. Meanwhile, in fiscal year 67, Health Education and Welfare's Office of Education spent $442 million of its total budget of three of three billion for such an education ventures as private industry was able to sell state and local boards. Yet, by comparison, both were far behind the Defense Department, whose four billion dollar education budget doubled the entire budget of the Office of Education. The education industrial complex developed as a fallback support for the producers of military hardware who saw the end of the Vietnam War as eventuality, as an eventuality, and who therefore felt the need to diversify. The fallback was rationalized as a need to accommodate the government by becoming involved in what George Champion, chairman of the board of directors for the Chase Manhattan Bank, antiseptically described as a social commercial enterprise. The social commercial enterprise or education industrial complex was rooted deeply in the earliest strategies of the Job Corps and the so-called war on poverty. Quite literally, in fact, some military industrialists and various breeds of systems cultists were taking over management of schools and school systems much as they had run job corps camps, thereby gaining experience in running test models. Linton Industries, for example, put together a community college in Oakland, Michigan, performing every chore right down to devising the curriculum and teaching the teachers how to implement it. Obviously, there is a bonanza for the producers of both, the hardware and software being introduced into these new schools as well as in old schools where grandiose claims are made on the behalf of the newfangled hardware to teach the so-called unteachable. Listen to these people. Obvious also is the fact that the willingness of the government to pick up the tabs for experimental equipment, albeit with money earmarked for the poor, is the break industry head Oh, is the break industry had in mind from the outset. A routine travesty committed by the OEO in 1966 shows clearly how the agency substituted the interests of the rich for those of the poor. A routine travesty committed by the Office of Economic Opportunity in 1966 shows clearly how the agency substituted the interests of the rich for those of the poor. So this was a job program for the rich, not for the people. On the first day of the fiscal year, July 1st, 1966, the OEO announced a $1.17 million contract for an array of computer computerized gag gaggetry. About 44% of the money, $443,750, went to the Board of Education of the City of New York with the remainder 660,000 used to purchase 20 talking typewriters formerly called the Edison Responsive Environment. The point of the deal, according to the OEO release, was to help New York's culturally deprived children and adults learn to read quickly. The revolutionary talking computers will also be used to teach reading skills to school dropouts and functionally illiterate adults during afternoon and evening classes. OEO had earlier completed a similar deal providing the same machines for the Chicago Welfare Department. The cost, $600,000. Beginning uh, in about 1964, the military industrial educationalists were obviously on a binge of producing gadgets at high cost experimenting with the unwitting poor while raking off the money ostensibly aimed at the poor. 
as the OEO had the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. We never hear about this stuff in today's world. I, I, you know, reading this book, we never hear about this stuff, y'all. If you're still watching, like and share the video, subscribe to the channel. This is the first reading. Um, this is going to be the last chapter I read, and then we will, um, you know, pick it uh, back up. In fact, um, we're going to go ahead and, um, and cut it here. We are on page 52 in chapter two, and we're going to come back uh, probably another day this week, maybe tomorrow, maybe Tuesday, and I'm going to finish reading because this is a actually a very, very long chapter. But it gets into the nitty gritty of how the federal programs that were actually meant for black people and other poor people never actually got to the people. The, the programs uh, fed and like, like today continue to feed the ultra wealthy the same way we have tax cuts for the rich, the same way, you know, things are still done. And he uncovered this, you know, uh, back in the 70s. You know, as you can see, we're going through the, the 60s here, looking at all of these different social welfare programs that never got to the people, you understand? So we're on page 52. We're going to start back up maybe tomorrow or later this week, but we're going to have to finish reading this book. I am reading for people who are just coming in the choice by Samuel F. Yet, who is now an ancestor, uh, but he was a prolific journalist um, that was warning black people um, of our um, survival and impending, um, you know, um, genocide. He uses that word here, um, and I just want to underscore before I end tonight. Make sure you um, like and subscribe to the, the to the channel, and uh, we want to make sure you all come back and finish listening to the reading of this book. Why I'm reading this book is because it is out of print. Uh, I believe you can find it for seven hundred dollars or something like that on um, on um, Amazon. I am not recommending that you buy anything from Amazon. We'll talk about that. But if you want to try to get this book, please try to go to a black-owned bookstore. I was able to get another copy from a black owned bookstore here in the Washington DC area. Uh, so I am reading this book because I think it's relevant even 50 years later when it was originally written in 1971. It is, it is still very relevant uh, to our current uh, predicament even here in this new year of 2021. It's even more dire now because technology has certainly advanced. And um, so anyway, also on Thursday, if you watch my video with Allison McDowell, she will be back on this Thursday to uh, continue the conversation about the Great Reset uh, and certainly about what the happenings are with the World Economic Forum. This is all connected, family. I'm trying to make the connections for everybody. So, and, so we're going to pause it there. We've been on here for two hours. That's crazy. So come on back. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you encourage your family and friends to subscribe. This has been Real Talk Uncensored. This book has been shadow banned. That's why I'm reading. Uh, but this is Real Talk Uncensored with ZSJ. I'm your host, Zakia Sankara Jabbar. Thank you, who, um, all of you who hung in there and listened uh, to this live reading of the choice from my brother Samuel uh, Yet. All right. So he was a uh, famous African-American journalist um, in our community. Thank you all for listening. I hope we'll maybe see you tomorrow night, but I will definitely see you on Thursday with our guest, Allison McDowell. Peace.